This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. From the North American Review, January 18, 1907. Chapters from My Autobiography, Chapter 10, by Mark Twain. Dictated March 28, 1906. Orion Clemens was born in Jamestown, Fentress County, Tennessee, in 1825. He was the family's firstborn, and antedated me ten years. Between him and me came a sister, Margaret, who died, aged ten, in 1837, in that village of Florida, Missouri, where I was born, and Pamela, mother of Samuel E. Moffat, who was an invalid all her life, and died in the neighborhood of New York a year ago, aged about seventy-five. Her character was without blemish, and she was of a most kindly and gentle disposition. Also there was a brother, Benjamin, who died in 1843, aged ten or twelve. Orion's boyhood was spent in that wee little log hamlet of Jamestown, up there among the knobs, so-called, of East Tennessee. The family migrated to Florida, Missouri, then moved to Hannibal, Missouri, when Orion was twelve and a half years old. When he was fifteen or sixteen, he was sent to St. Louis, and there he learned the printer's trade. One of his characteristics was eagerness. He woke with an eagerness about some matter or other every morning. It consumed him all day. It perished in the night, and he was on fire with a fresh new interest next morning, before he could get his clothes on. He exploited in this way three hundred and sixty-five red-hot new eagernesses every year of his life. But I am forgetting another characteristic, a very pronounced one. That was his deep glooms, his despondencies, his despairs. These had their place in each and every day along with the eagerness. Thus his day was divided—no, not divided—mottled—from sunrise to midnight, with alternating brilliant sunshine and black cloud. Every day he was the most joyous and hopeful man that ever was, I think, and also every day he was the most miserable man that ever was. While he was in his apprenticeship in St. Louis, he got well acquainted with Edward Bates, who was afterwards in Mr. Lincoln's first cabinet. Bates was a very fine man, an honorable and upright man, and a distinguished lawyer. He patiently allowed Orion to bring to him each new project. He discussed it with him, and extinguished it by argument and irresistible logic, at first. But after a few weeks he found that this labor was not necessary, that he could leave the new project alone, and it would extinguish itself the same night. Orion thought he would like to become a lawyer. Mr. Bates encouraged him, and he studied law nearly a week, then, of course, laid it aside to try something new. He wanted to become an orator. Mr. Bates gave him lessons. Mr. Bates walked the floor reading from an English book aloud, and rapidly turning the English into French, and he recommended this exercise to Orion. But as Orion knew no French, he took up that study and wrought at it like a volcano for two or three days, then gave it up. During his apprenticeship in St. Louis, he joined a number of churches, one after another, and taught in their Sunday schools, changing his Sunday school every time he changed his religion. He was correspondingly erratic in his politics, Whig today, Democrat next week, and anything fresh that he could find in the political market the week after. I may remark here that throughout his long life he was always trading religions and enjoying the change of scenery. I will also remark that his sincerity was never doubted, his truthfulness was never doubted, and in matters of business and money his honesty was never questioned. Notwithstanding his forever recurring caprices and changes, his principles were high, always high, and absolutely unshakable. He was the strangest compound that ever got mixed in a human mould. Such a person as that is given to acting upon impulse and without reflection. That was Orion's way. Everything he did he did with conviction and enthusiasm, and with a vainglorious pride in the thing he was doing, and no matter what that thing was, whether good, bad, or indifferent, he repented of it every time in sackcloth and ashes before twenty-four hours had sped. Pessimists are born, not made. Optimists are born, not made. But I think he was the only person I have ever known in whom pessimism and optimism were lodged in exactly equal proportions. Except in the matter of grounded principle, he was as unstable as water. You could dash his spirits with a single word. You could raise them into the sky again with another one. 
You could break his heart with a word of disapproval. You could make him as happy as an angel with a word of approval. And there was no occasion to put any sense or any vestige of mentality of any kind into these miracles. Anything you might say would answer. He had another conspicuous characteristic, and it was the father of those which I have just spoken of. This was an intense lust for approval. He was so eager to be approved, so girlishly anxious to be approved by anybody and everybody, without discrimination, that he was commonly ready to forsake his notions, opinions, and convictions at a moment's notice in order to get the approval of any person who disagreed with them. I wish to be understood as reserving his fundamental principles all the time. He never forsook those to please anybody. Born and reared among slaves and slaveholders, he was yet an abolitionist from his boyhood to his death. He was always truthful, he was always sincere, he was always honest and honorable. But in light matters, matters of small consequence, like religion and politics and such things, he never acquired a conviction that could survive a disappointing remark from a cat. He was always dreaming. He was a dreamer from birth, and this characteristic got him into trouble now and then. Once, when he was twenty-three or twenty-four years old, and was become a journeyman, he conceived the romantic idea of coming to Hannibal without giving us notice, in order that he might furnish to the family a pleasant surprise. If he had given notice, he would have been informed that we had changed our residence, and that that gruff old bass-voiced sailor-man, Dr. G., our family physician, was living in the house which we had formerly occupied, and that Orion's former room in that house was now occupied by Dr. G.'s two middle-aged maiden sisters. Orion arrived at Hannibal per steamship in the middle of the night, and started with his customary eagerness on his excursion, his mind all on fire with his romantic project and building and enjoying his surprise in advance. He was always enjoying things in advance. It was the make of him. He never could wait for the event, but must build it out of dream-stuff and enjoy it beforehand. Consequently, sometimes when the event happened, he saw that it was not as good as the one he had invented in his imagination, and so he had lost profit by not keeping the imaginary one and letting the reality go. When he arrived at the house, he went around to the back door and slipped off his boots and crept upstairs and arrived at the room of those elderly ladies without having awakened any sleepers. He undressed in the dark and got into bed and snuggled up against somebody. He was a little surprised, but not much, for he thought it was our brother Ben. It was winter, and the bed was comfortable, and the supposed bed added to the comfort, and so he was dropping off to sleep very well satisfied with his progress so far, and full of happy dreams of what was going to happen in the morning. But something else was going to happen sooner than that, and it happened now. The maid that was being crowded fumed and fretted and struggled, and presently came to a half-waking condition and protested against the crowding. That voice paralyzed Orion. He couldn't move a limb. He couldn't get his breath. And the crowded one discovered his new whiskers and began to scream. This removed the paralysis, and Orion was out of the bed and clawing round in the dark for his clothes in a fraction of a second. Both maids began to scream then, so Orion did not wait to get his whole wardrobe. He started with such parts of it as he could grab. He flew to the head of the stairs and started down, and was paralyzed again at that point, because he saw the faint yellow flame of a candle soaring up the stairs from below, and he judged that Dr. G. was behind it, and he was. He had no clothes on to speak of, but no matter, he was well enough fixed for an occasion like this, because he had a butcher-knife in his hand. Orion shouted to him, and this saved his life, for the doctor recognized his voice. Then in those deep sea-going bass tones of his that I used to admire so much when I was a little boy, he explained to Orion the change that had been made, told him where to find the Clemens family, and closed with some quite unnecessary advice about posting himself before he undertook another adventure like that, advice which Orion probably never needed again as long as he lived. One bitter December night Orion sat up reading until three o'clock in the morning, and then, without looking at a clock, sallied forth to call on a young lady. He hammered and hammered at the door, couldn't get any response, didn't understand it. Anybody else would have regarded that as an indication of some kind or other, and would have drawn inferences and gone home. But Orion didn't draw inferences. He merely hammered and hammered, and finally the father of the girl appeared at the door in a dressing-gown. He had a candle in his hand, and the dressing-gown was all the clothing he had on, except an expression of unwelcome, which was so thick and so large, that it extended all down his front to his instep, 
and nearly obliterated the dressing-gown. But Orion didn't notice that this was an unpleasant expression. He merely walked in. The old gentleman took him into the parlor, set the candle on a table, and stood. Orion made the usual remarks about the weather, and sat down. Sat down and talked and talked, and went on talking, that old man looking at him vindictively and waiting for his chance, waiting treacherously and malignantly for his chance. Orion had not asked for the young lady. It was not customary. It was understood that a young fellow came to see the girl of the house, not the founder of it. At last Orion got up and made some remark to the effect that probably the young lady was busy, and he would go now and call again. That was the old man's chance, and he said with fervency, "'Why, good land, aren't you going to stop for breakfast?' Orion did not come to Hannibal until two or three years after my father's death. Meantime he remained in St. Louis. He was a journeyman printer, and earning wages. Out of his wage he supported my mother and my brother Henry, who was two years younger than I. My sister Pamela helped in this support by taking piano pupils. Thus we got along, but it was pretty hard sledding. I was not one of the burdens, because I was taken from school at once, upon my father's death, and placed in the office of the Hannibal Courier, as printer's apprentice and Mr. S., the editor and proprietor of the paper, allowed me the usual emolument of the office of apprentice, that is to say, board and clothes, but no money. The clothes consisted of two suits a year, but one of the suits always failed to materialize, and the other suit was not purchased so long as Mr. S.'s old clothes held out. I was only about half as big as Mr. S., consequently his shirts gave me the uncomfortable sense of living in a circus tent and I had to turn up his pants to my ears to make them short enough. There were two other apprentices. One was Steve Wilkins, seventeen or eighteen years old, and a giant. When he was in Mr. S.'s clothes they fitted him as the candle-mold fits the candle. Thus he was generally in a suffocated condition, particularly in the summer-time. He was a reckless, hilarious, admirable creature. He had no principles, and was delightful company. At first we three apprentices had to feed in the kitchen with the old slave cook and her very handsome and bright and well-behaved young mulatto daughter. For his own amusement, for he was not generally laboring for other people's amusement, Steve was constantly and persistently and loudly and elaborately making love to that mulatto girl and distressing the life out of her, and worrying the old mother to death. She would say, "'Now, Mar Steve, Mar Steve, can't you behave yourself?' With encouragement like that, Steve would naturally renew his attentions and emphasize them. It was killingly funny to Ralph and me. And, to speak truly, the old mother's distress about it was merely a pretense. She quite well understood that by the customs of slaveholding communities it was Steve's right to make love to that girl if he wanted to. But the girl's distress was very real. She had a refined nature, and she took all Steve's extravagant love-making in resentful earnest. We got but little variety in the way of food at that kitchen table, and there wasn't enough of it anyway, so we apprentices used to keep alive by arts of our own. That is to say, we crept into the cellar nearly every night by a private entrance which we had discovered, and we robbed the cellar of potatoes and onions and such things, and carried them downtown to the printing office, where we slept on pallets on the floor, and cooked them at the store, and had very good times. As I have indicated, Mr. S.'s economies were of a pretty close and rigid kind. By and by, when we apprentices were promoted from the basement to the ground floor, and allowed to sit at the family table, along with the one journeyman, Harry H., the economies continued. Mrs. S. was a bride. She had attained to that distinction very recently, after waiting a good part of a lifetime for it and she was the right woman in the right place according to the economies of the place, for she did not trust the sugar-bowl to us, but sweetened our coffee herself. That is, she went through the motions. She didn't really sweeten it. She seemed to put one heaping teaspoonful of brown sugar into each cup, but according to Steve that was a deceit. He said she dipped the spoon in the coffee first to make the sugar stick, and then scooped the sugar out of the bowl with the spoon upside down, so that the effect to the eye was a heaped-up spoon, whereas the sugar on it was nothing but a layer. This all seems perfectly true to me, and yet that thing would be so difficult to perform that I suppose it really didn't happen, but was one of Steve's lies. Mark Twain. To be Continued. <laughs>